Second uh, Chronicles uh, 14 through 16 is about Asa. He was a good king, right? Good in the 36th year, he gets in a fight, but Basha fights him, and the last five years of his reign are war. And why did that happen? What happened to him? In the beginning, he started out really good, but what did he do? Oh, anyway, wasn't he? Wasn't that the tree? He tried to. Make, he made the tree. He went to <laughs> another king instead of God to deliver yeah. him. To deliver him. Instead now, trusting God, he trusted. He trusted yeah. a man instead of God. And the thing is, is that he wasn't. God never said that he had a divided heart. He made a mistake. So it was a big one, and he had a big consequence. But the truth is, is that unless the word of God says he failed, we cannot say he failed. Yeah. We just can't. I don't, you know, I'm thankful because I guess, you know, uh, yesterday, if I did something dumb and everybody said I failed, then maybe today I wouldn't be here. Do you know what I'm trying to say? It's like we live our lives with human beings. We make mistakes. We do dumb things. Well, you look at I mean, David. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But he never said he I mean, he was always full of after, follow, he was, after, you know, his heart was full of God. Right, right. And and do we get disappointed? Yes. Do we get frustrated? Mm -hmm. Do we think, God, what are you doing here? This is not funny. I don't like it. Yeah. Of course. Of course. So Chronicles is talking about this life of King Asa. And he died in his 44th year, 41st year of his rule with a horribly diseased feet. Why do you think that? Why do you think his feet were diseased? So why do you think he he God gave him diseased feet? Oh. <clears throat> why did God give me his feet? Well no, I mean I think there's a reason. I think I'm sure there's there's something I'm sure there's a reason it's his feet and not something else. But what do we do with our feet? Walk to walk. Where was he walking? He was walking in the wrong direction. Exactly. Yeah. And that's all. There's some metaphor there. There's a metaphor there. So that is very important to understand what is going on. Now, um, chapter 15, uh, verses 23 through 34, okay? So we have some kings. We're just going to generally talk about what's going on. We're not going to go all the way through it. We'll really pick up in 60. But in chapter 15, we see 1524, Asa dies. Okay, that chapter. And this is about 870 B.C. So, 1525, this is Nadab, becomes king. And when does he become king? <clears throat> it's kind of a historical. We're in 1525. This Second year of Asa was king. king. Right. Yeah. King in Asa's second year. Now, one of the things that can be really complicated about Old Testament is that it kind of jumps around. Like we want it to be organized. Sometimes it's not chronological. So it's it's really, you know, you just that's why it's important to pay attention to the time, the time frames. And what did Nadab do? He did evil in the son of the Lord. All right. He was, I'm just going to do a little uh, pitchfork, evil in the side of the Lord. And he built what? What did he do? Golden calves. Mm -hmm. He worshiped golden calves. Where did he learn that from? Who was the first king to do that? His, was it his father? Yeah. Yeah. Jeroboam. Yeah. Because what did Jeroboam do? He set up two golden calves in uh, Bethel and the other town that I can't remember. 
but he builds, he makes two golden calves. Then in 1527, Basher comes on the scene. So here's Nadab. I'm not going to write all the details. He becomes king, and what does he do? Basha? Mm -hmm. Kill him. Uh, Killed Nadab. Killed him. He kills Nadab. And what else does he do? He reigned in his place. Okay, and what else does he do? Okay. He, he killed the whole house off oh, yeah. of Jeroboam. And the whole house. Is that for, uh, uh, a prophetic fulfillment? Yes. Okay. okay. The whole house of Jeroboam. That's pretty sobering. So this is referring to 1 Kings 14.10. This is when uh, the prophet comes and says, you know, this is what's going to happen to you. I'm, I'm trying to get organized here. 1 Kings 14.10. So 1 Kings 14.10. I mean that's that's pretty much when you when you see these things happen, it's it's just like why don't people think it's gonna happen to them? You know, a prophet comes and tells Jeroboam, this was gonna happen to you. It isn't that long from Jeroboam, Je Nadab is his son. Basha knows had to have known Jeroboam, right? And he sees that and he kills the whole house. It's amazing to me. So Basha, how long did he rule? Two years. 24 years. Uh, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. 1533 through 34 says so Basha ruled 24 20, 20. years and did evil. So he is 24 years. He's the king. Wonderful guy. <laughs> And so in first, uh, uh, first Kings 16, he receives a word. So Basha hears from who? Jehu. Jehu? Yeah. Well, that can is. <laughs> Jehu the prophet, right? The son of Hananiah. And so what does he say? What does the prophet say? I, you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel sin. This right. is what God is saying, provoking me to anger. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, in 1 Kings 14, 4 through 11, the prophecy of Ahijah to Jeroboam's wife is, your family will be destroyed and eaten by the dogs or the birds. The destruction came because Basha killed Jeroboam's house, something only the Lord was allowed to do, basically, right? So he's telling him, what? You walked in the ways of Jeroboam, you made my people sin, and you provoked me to anger. I just don't understand. Why, why don't we get it? <laughs> We're not very bright. <laughs> <laughs> and well, and they grew up in it. The, the the fathers did it, so they followed suit. Okay. So, why is our salvation an individual choice? Why is it not based on our parents? I guess we have free will. There you go. See, the thing is, is that is does it mean that because they they had horrible examples and no other uh, godly influence that they somehow be part of it? An so absolute power corrupts absolutely. Absolute power corrupts absolutely because they do not believe that God will punish them. Yeah. But what's that uh, cliche you hear that bad corrupts good every time? Right. Right. That's pretty strong. Bad corrupts good every time. 
But what is God doing? Is he ignoring it? Is he just going to go? I'm fixing to take care of this. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to, I'm going to fix it up so that you are really, you get it. Yeah. I just think that this, uh, the prophecy is saying something to him, even though, right? And he, he, even though he sees it, um, he doesn't seem to understand or doesn't believe it's going to happen to him. I, I just think that's pretty, yeah. pretty crazy. It can't happen to me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Have that to right, right. So who's the next king on the list? <laughs> Eli. Eli. <laughs> so we have Baja, you know, and I put a little port pitchfork and then Eli. What kind of sign does he get with a pitchfork? <laughs> Evil. <laughs> he reigned two years. And what happened to him? Zimri. This guy, man, I couldn't believe him. He's the general over the chariots. He's a general over half the chariots of the army. I guess that makes you a good ruler. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. He kills uh, Elah. And how long does he uh, rule? He ruled seven days. Okay. And which one? Zim 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 Man, this guy. Well, I have a little question I wrote in the studies. Now, Zimmerman, right? A servant became king of Israel? Yep. How did that happen? He just killed off the previous king. You see, <laughs> oh, right. what is that? That's all it takes? That's all it takes, apparently, in uh, Israel. Well, what? Because, so it, it creates a whole series of events, right? So he Ela reigns two years. His servant Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him. He was at Tizra drinking himself drunk in the house of Azra, who was over the household of Tizra. So many names. What kind of guy is Ela? A drunk. <laughs> He's a drunk. He drinks. That's all he does. He just plowed down the alcohol. I'd be plowing down the alcohol too if I was having a whole bunch of crazy people like this. <laughs> but Zimri went in, struck him, and put him to death in the 27th year of Asa. A lot of kings going on here, right? Here's Asa. Now, what? Let me I keep referring to what, what happened. Asa was still there. So Asa is the yeah. king of Judah, and he's watching this. Mm -hmm. So how does God protect Asa? He allows this internal, right? He's doing two things. He's killing, quote, several birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. He is showing Asa his protection by not allowing mm -hmm. these guys in Israel, because if they didn't have each other to fight, they'd be going after him, right? True. And so at the same time, he's showing Asa the failure of this kingdom, as a reminder to Asa, hey, you need to listen to me because whenever you walk away from me, you will see failure, basically. This, this kings of the north have seen incredible failure. It's, it's unbelievable. So as soon as he becomes the king, as soon as he sat on his throne, he killed the household of Basha. He did not leave a single male, neither of his relatives or his friends. That was quite a tough guy. So Zimri wipes out the whole house, right, yeah. of Elah. He destroyed all the household of Basha, of Basha. Basha is Elah's father. Yeah. According to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Basha through Jehu the prophet. So he's fulfilling that. Verse 13, for all the sins of Basha and the sins of Elah, his son, which they sinned in which they made Israel sin, provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. Provoking, provoke, provoke, provoke. What does that word mean? Uh, pushes. 
poking the bear. Just you know, pushes you. Right? Just pushes poking the bear. bear. You know, can you know, just doing this. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me show you what I can do. <sighs> it's snubbing their nose at God. It's poking the bear. Ooh. So. In the 27th year, verse 15, of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days at Tizra. Now the people were camped against Gibbah, and which belonged to the Philistine. Philistine. The people who were camped heard it said, Zimri has conspired and has also struck down the king. Therefore, all Israel made Omri the commander of the army king over Israel that day in the camp. Hmm. So the next guy is Omri. <laughs> So what happens there? At least he's a commander and not a servant. <laughs> right. So Omri, what's it about? What what is interesting about this guy? So he goes up and he besieges Tizra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When when Zimri saw the house was that the city was taken, he went into the city. This is a crazy thing about Zimri. What does he do? He burned the house down. He killed himself. Yeah, he killed himself. He crazy killed man kills himself. He sees the city is taken. He goes into the citadel, the king's house, burns the key's king's house over him with fire and dies. Yeah, I thought that was weird. Yeah, it <laughs> says he was walking in the way of Jeroboam, the guy his family he just wiped out, and in his sin, which he did, making Israel sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and his conspiracy, which he carried out, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the King? Right. Then the people are in a civil war. Now we've got civil war. Yep. The people following Omri prevail over the people following Tibni. Okay. So Tibni dies. Omri becomes king. Yeah. And in the 31st year of Asa, Omri becomes king over Israel and reigned 12 years. And he reigned six years in Tizra. So he reigns 12 years. What is important about him? He built a city. Yes. What city did he build? Samaria. He built Samaria. And it is at this point that Israel is no longer called Israel by all the nations around them. They're called Samaria. They become the Samaritans. I think that is incredibly important. Uh, it's like um, when you start to think about the way that the name was changed, God never calls Israel Samaria. Mm -hmm. And we look at Elijah. He doesn't say Samaria. He says Israel. You have done this to Israel. When he talks to Ahab. It, it's it, God. That, that is the height of insult to God for his chosen people to take another name. To, no. deny, to, not, to deny that. That's denying him yes. completely. Is uh, is that why, you know, when Jesus was walking up the earth, they didn't like the Samaritans at all. Is that right. why? Uh, the reason, yes, it's part of it. But what happened, and and this, hopefully, we'll get to that when we look at the last kings, mm -hmm. um, uh, Zedekiah being the the, the last king of, of uh, Judah. What the Babylonians did. Or what the Assyrians did, actually, because the Assyrians took over Israel in 722 B.C. And so what they did is they moved the people from, a lot of the people from Israel out to other nations and moved other nations in. Okay? And then there started to be all kinds of problems. And a, and a priest came to the, to the, I can't remember which king, Assyrian king it was, and said, you need to put priests back in the land so that the lions and the animals are not eating all the people because the, the whole land just revolted through God's or, ordained work. And so they sent priests back in. Now, those priests were northern tribe priests. So they start blending not only the false doctrine mm -hmm. of the northern tribes, 
but they start incorporating people from other tribes, their belief systems and stuff like that together. And that creates the Samaritans. Now, you were in Ezra with me. And so one of the very interesting things about that is that these people uh, in the fourth chapter, they're building the foundation of the temple, right? And so here comes this group of people that have been living in the land, Samaritans. And they said, we believe like you. Let us build the temple with you. Because they had incorporated parts of the Old Testament, the, 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 the Torah, the first five chapters, with their false religion. And they wanted to participate in building that temple. And Zerubbabel said, no way. We have nothing to do with you. And cut that off. And then they, then they started trying to war against the Jews were trying to stop them from building. When Jesus talked to a Samaritan woman, she said, you worship on this mountain. Yeah. We worship on this mountain. So this incredible division, they were part Jewish, but they had incorporated. This was the long-term effect of the consequence of following these false gods, of revamping and redoing the religion, quote unquote, or the relationship and how you reach God. That's what they did. And when you see it towards the end, you see how it affects. I mean, Israel never came back. 722 BC, they never return back to the land. They're lost. They're the lost 10 northern tribes. It's, it's kind of powerful to think about that. Yeah. Because God is, what do you know about God? He is faithful to himself because he's right and true and perfect and just and he <clears throat> will not allow his word to be corrupted tough place yep yeah. so it says um he walked the ways of verse 26 16 26 he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Debat, and in the sins which he made Israel sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel with their idols. And the rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and his might, which he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? Omri slept with his fathers, was buried in Samaria, and he was his son. Ahab, Ahab is. Ahab is his son. I, I find it interesting that the Zimri didn't live, didn't rule long enough to even be called even be accused of sinning and leading the people in sin. <laughs> yeah. 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 So then we get back to Omri, who was a bad character, and so we can put a pitchfork by him. But, but <laughs> what 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 Zimri did he fulfill props. God's judgment on Israel. When you really think about it, one of the things that we have to think about is the fact that God judges. He is the judge and he uses whatever means he determines to be right. I mean, it's like, golly, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. So in the 31st year, 1623, uh, 31st year of uh, Asa, Omri becomes the king, rules 12 years, builds Samaria. And then we see Ahab. Found us a cabbie. Yeah, yes, I guess so. Oh, oh maybe. He's kind of, uh, uh, you, know, you know. He's crying. I know. And he's <laughs> he's laying laying up up up. You think he'd be laying out the sun. <laughs> He's like, thank God, somebody let me in. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, he's going to try to be friendly with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so it came about, here we have Ahab, verse 29, becomes the king in the 38th year of Asa. Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Ahab was king 22 years. Oh, my gosh. Gave him a lot of time to do all his badness. Man, I tell you what, he was a bad guy. So, um, he married Jezebel. Yes, yes, yes he did. 
And uh, man, she was, she, bad girl. she was bad. My goodness. And it says, what did he do? Now, I want you to know that one of the things I was kind of reading, I'm, I'm writing a separate paper on the, I was reading about historically that it is that it was actually Omri who made the agreement with the king, the Phoenician king, for that king's daughter to marry Omri's son. Okay. So that was a treaty between them. And so uh, it wasn't like Ahab went out and said, hey, I want to get this babe. Mm -hmm. His father set that up with the, the Phoenician king. And so, man, that's that's a that's a very serious thing because it sets up an entire process. And it says, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Now think about this. Omri comes on the scene after civil war, becomes the king. He's not even like of the family, the original family, right? Who Jeroboam, was he a royal person? What was he? What was his job? Do you remember what Jeroboam did? He was he, he was a manager. Chief, chief officials for Solomon, wasn't he? He was he, what did he do? He he took care of the building projects with all the slaves. So he was just a manager. He managed the people in the building projects. Okay? He wasn't from any kind of royal line. Uh, yes. And so we see this 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 whole process. Then one guy, the next guy, the next guy, all these different people come on. They're from all kinds of backgrounds. And um, it says in verse 31, it, was, it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Then he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonites. He was a Phoenician king and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ta-da! We've got the connection now. He's the king. He worships Baal. And what else does he do? He sets up worship in Samaria for all the nation to worship Baal. No big deal. He made the Asherah. What's the difference between Baal and Asherah? Do y'all know? Did you get a chance to look at it? I did. Um, Baal was was the god of fertility and I, I forget all the all the different things. He was also the god of thunder and lightning. Thunder and lightning. It was depicted with lightning bolts right. in, his, right. in his hand. Uh, where was it? I wrote a bunch of stuff down, I think. Uh, somewhere. No pressure. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, wait, you're asking me this way. The Ashra. Oh, a spring god in Canaan and Phoenicia became widespread during the reign of Ahab, right? Um, which also affected Judah. Fertility god for crops and children. Uh, he was supposedly the son of El and Asherah, right? A, a god that has parents, you know. Right. So. <laughs> Seen right. as the most powerful of God, worshipped as sun and storm god. Usually holding light and bells and fertility got rooted in sensuality, involved in ritual prostitution in the temples. Human sacrifices were required at times. And then on Asherah, I had kind of conflicting things. One place that was goddess of the sea, represented, she was represented as a limbless tree, which was why they made a pole. Uh, she was also considered the moon goddess, consort of Baal. So there was kind of, you know, was she the mother, the wife? You know. She was, yeah, it's a combination between a consort and a grove. In other words, yeah. Asherah was a, what they built a grove like a, and you remember how the, the, the Jews would worship high places? Mm -hmm. So it is a pagan high place. Yes. Okay. I'm Which would... There. Right, which would be equivalent to a mistress to the god, okay, because she is where you go to physically meet, 
and worship Baal. Yeah. It's also, that, you know, based on sensuality, oh. you know, so. <laughs> It's cat, y'all. Okay. So, yeah, man, it's like, woo. <laughs> so, yeah, Ahab just don't step on my computer. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Ail, the best light, Built Jericho. He laid a foundation with the loss of air. And, and now, what do you think about that? Why is this statement in 34 in there? Why is that there? Well, because I'd already been warned not to rebuild Jericho. Right. Don't do it because right. bad things happen. Right. Yeah, thank you, Kat. And the loss of your children. Then you walk on the keyboard. <laughs> Uh, if, if something happened to you people online, uh, it was the cat. <laughs> so uh, okay. I think it's okay, but it, it's easy. Did you let me pick him up? Yeah, he will. He's heavy. He's a big old cat. Is it okay? Did he walk He's, okay? It's still recording. Yeah. Okay, good deal. So uh, the point is, is that why did they do this? Why, you know, the thing is, is that if you throw one thing away, how many more things are you going to throw away of God? I mean, it just, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's downward spiral. Downward spiral. Well, it's a trivial thing. Yeah, it's a trivial they thing. They were so far gone that it yeah. now was, it was trivial to, yeah. to do right. all this. Well, it's, it's accepted. Well, and what does it say about God? Does God overlook or forget? No, no, God never overlooks it. I can't read that story. <laughs> God never overlooks, no matter how long ago. It's been a long time, right? From Joshua to now. Yeah. And uh, God doesn't forget. He hadn't forgotten the warning about rebuilding uh, Jericho. No, he doesn't forget. I think it's just. Cat is determined to have your attention. I mean, I can let me let me get him in. He's okay. He'll move in a minute. Okay, okay. I gotta keep on. I gotta do the time. Okay, so all right. Now we're in First Kings seventeen. Oh my goodness! What do we think about this chapter? I'm gonna erase a little bit of this. It's kind of weird, you know, this, all of a sudden we just throw Elijah in, you yep. know, it's like we're king, 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 and uh, oh, Elijah, uh, go over here and tell him this, and then escape, go over here to this brook, you know, hold on, let me go over here and close this door, okay, just let him stay in there, <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like an interlude, you yes. know, or something, <laughs> okay, so, It's a very, I, I just really enjoyed it. I, I, I'm, I'm probably going to teach this, this as part of my teaching when I do that conference because it's so good. Yeah. So Elijah goes to Ahab and says, he just shows up. Now look, that, that to me is pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, he goes to, um, and it's, and Elijah the Tishbite actually is saying he is from Tish. But he's a he's from there, and so I kind of looked up some of this stuff to make sure I understood. Um, I don't have it in these notes. Well, there you go. I didn't write it down. I have it in some other notes elsewhere, but not here, of course. All right. So he he uh, goes to Ahab, and he says, "As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives." You might see that. Calls him Israel, doesn't call it Samaria. He's not the God of Samaria. He's the God of Israel. Before whom I stand, surely there will neither there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Wow. The word of the Lord came to him saying, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. Now, I'm sure King Ahab's like, he did, you don't hear him say anything. He makes the announcement, he turns away and walks off. That's basically what he did. 
Because the word said, uh, get out of there right now. He's hiding you. Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. I looked up these these maps, these places. So, so he says to Ahab, no rain unless I say so. Wow. Then he says. Um, he goes away. So Elijah goes to where? Cherith. Cherith. Now, this is a very interesting word. Cherith means cutting. There's some things about this that really stood out to me. Uh, words matter. Words really, really matter. He goes to Cherith. That word means cutting. And he says you're going to drink from the brook. And what else is he going to do? And they're going to be fed yeah. by what? The ravens. What is a raven? Bird. What kind of bird? Do you know? Predatory or unclean. Unclean yeah, birds. birds. Yeah. yeah. That is an unclean bird. That is very, very interesting. So I looked up ravens. Ravens are what they call a selfish bird. So if a raven has to feed its chick or itself, it'll feed itself first. It will not save its chickens, its little babies. Hmm. So there's a reason why God says, cutting, I'm sending you to a difficult place. Now, there's get, with no rain, what do you have? You have a drought. Mm -hmm. When drought. you have a drought, what happens? Everything oh, crops die. dies. Everything dies. So there's no food because there's a drought. So a drought, no food, all right? And God is using a special brook. He set him aside. He's cutting something away from Elijah. I, I just, the more I thought about it, it's like, what is he trying to say here? Elijah suffered also. He was doing God's will. He was doing what God told him to do. And by the way, his name means my God is Yahweh. Now he's a prophet to the northern tribes, but he had godly parents. Here is here's the big, here's a big thing that's going on here. We see all of these kings, these wicked kings, what kind of parents did they have? Wicked parents. Wicked parents. Taught them nothing. Wasn't concerned with them at all. We have Elijah, whose name means my God is Yahweh, is telling you that he has godly parents who are teaching him what is right and what is wrong. He's a plain spoken guy. He dresses like a backwoods person. He just walks right up and says, bam, this is it. Obeys God and goes to the work of Cherith. But you see, this isn't the end of the story. And sometimes when God is working in someone's life, they have to, a little bit of a victory and a little cutting away, a little more, because what happens? What would, what would be the problem if God did not help Elijah see what it is to suffer in this way? What would be the problem to Elijah's heart? Pride. There you go. What is what you said? Pride. 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 That's exactly yeah. it. Think about what he's saying. Well, one of the, one something that I read sometime or other about Elijah said that not only did he make this announcement to Ahab, he actually prayed down this drought, basically. Yeah. And he knew what it was going to do to the nation and to the people. And he was willing to sacrifice himself even because well, he was obedient to God's word. 
Well, it's important to recognize that God, th that the name, God is sending him there purposefully to protect him. Mm -hmm. But also, I looked at some cross references. Um, Hebrews 2, 18 says, for since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. 4.15, Hebrews 4.15 for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all the things as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So what basically he's saying is that this guy, Hebrews 2, 18 and Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 are telling us that God wanted to protect Elijah's heart and mature him as a servant. See, there's, there's something about this that, that the more I thought about it, we're going to talk about the rest of the stuff that happens, but the more I thought about it, it's like, why would he put if this guy, why would he, why does he put us through things like we have this incredible victory or we have this, we make this stand for the Lord. And then the very next thing that happens to us, we feel like we're under attack, right? If this happened in a modern setting, you know, I stand up and I tell people, blah, 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 all this stuff. I'm standing for the Lord without reservation. And then I walk out the door and I get robbed. Right? And you felt like, did he feel, he felt like he got robbed by God. I would be like, well, what did I do wrong? Yeah, what did I do wrong? Exactly. But he didn't do anything wrong. God is helping him to understand that, that how he needs to be able to go back because he's going to go next to the widow. Mm -hmm. Why is he going to the widow? You know, he the way he handles himself, it's it's kind of amazing to me. Mm -hmm. But he would not have been doing that. God knew what he needed, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when things happen, and we don't understand why that's happening. We need to ask ourselves. Is there something in me that the Lord is trying to affect or change or help me see to make me grow in my walk? Well, Elijah had total trust in God right. and total confidence that God was going to manage whatever it was. And he was getting his instructions from the word of God. Right. And he had complete confidence in that. Right. And there's what I like. Well, one of the things, you know. How how did well, he, he's helping him get through his suffering. I mean, Elisha's had suffering. Right. And he God want, pick, wants him to do what he's doing because he has had that suffering. And I guess he's helping him get through his suffering so that he can help other people in their suffering. And why did Jesus have to suffer? I mean, why couldn't he just go up and get on the cross and die? Wouldn't that be enough? I mean, it was enough. But why did he suffer? To to show us how they will suffer. So because he could understand how we felt. So he had a merciful high priest who understands. When God called Elijah to be the voice, and Elijah had no personal uh, experience with what the people were experiencing, it was a judgment without compassion. It doesn't mature you to be right. I mean, that's really true. Yeah. Being right, being uh, being the uh, the voice, doesn't mean that that person standing up here is mature. Right. What makes us grow is when we understand where that person is coming from, what they're going through, and then we can say, "I have been through what you're going through." But God has empowered me and he will empower you too. That's what this is about. Because there is more coming. Everything that Elijah does, you know, he does something, then he's tested. He does something else, then he's tested. He does something else, 
then he's tested. Is that how our Christian walk is? It is. Pretty much. Yeah. It is that way. Now, we might think, it's, you know, I, uh, people say, oh, it's just the devil. The devil's after me. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe that's not what's going on. Maybe it's that God is saying, hey, you know, uh, you're on the right track, but I want to mature you even more. I want you to understand more intimately, more personally, what I'm doing and how I can use you. We are very, very, God is very black and white. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Right, wrong. There's, yeah. there's no deviation gray. in that. Yeah, there's no gray area. However, we are very black and white when we don't have a leg to stand on because we do not think like God does. So when God looks at me, he knows what I need to get me more in line with him. Ultimately, and whatever we do, it is an individual walk. That's why we can't say to somebody else, well, you know, you're not doing it right. Well, how do I know you're not doing it right? I mean, who, who am I? Do you know what I'm, see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so Ahab, I'm sure King Ahab is like, who is this jerk? You know? Well, that's what I was wondering. Uh, we, we keep saying Elijah just appears. And that's, yeah, he just walked out. I'm the reading a little, a, little, a little bit of commentary. It looks like he just appeared. He did. And somebody had no history with him. He did not know him. Yeah. I think that's amazing. That takes a lot of guts. Mm -hmm. He's not He's not afraid. Elijah is not afraid. But maybe Elijah needed compassion. I had a precept teacher years and years ago, the best precept teacher I've ever sat under. Oh my gosh, she was amazing. She was hard. She was very dictatorish in a way. Wrong, right. Yeah. You know, very, you know, and and although she was technically accurate, mm -hmm. where is her compassion to know what it feels like to try to make the right decision when you when you're struggling with that? He needed to know what it was like to be without the food and without the water. And to rely on a, a, a unclean bird to feed him. That would be, you know, as a, as a Jew who believes in God, who knows the law, that would well, be. Well, cool. but not only the birds, he sent him to a Gentile woman, the widow, you know, so he was. A Phoenician woman. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty tough. He's, God is maturing him for the next step. So when we are serving the Lord, we should expect that when circumstances happen, that it may not always be because the devil is trying to get us. He is always trying to get us. That doesn't change. But maybe God is trying to mature us. I need to ask him, Lord, is this something that I'm missing? Help me to understand. We need to have ears to hear the Lord because he probably wouldn't have taken food from a raven if God had said, Absolutely. I'm going to feed you. That's right. And he had to be hungry enough to say, hey, I'm going to eat that. No, I'm uh -huh. Thirsty enough to drink from that thing. I mean, you know, sometimes get, things get taken away from us and we're like, I'm so sorry. I didn't pay attention to that. I sure wish I had that now. <laughs> right. So we're doing good. All right. So what happens? He went, verse five, lived by the brook. The ravens brought him bread and meat and bread and meat in the evening in the morning. He'd drink from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. I looked up another one. Philippians 4.19. Let me look up that one. I, I meant to mark that and I didn't do it. I love that. I love Philippians. I, I, I might have to go back and choose Philippians again. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty good. <laughs> And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So God's people might suffer, but he always provides. What kind of situation are we in right now in this country? Are we suffering? I'm, I am. I'm I'm dying. Dying. We're in a dire situation. And yet, this being without power for a week has really clarified some things to me. <laughs> I, I am so very spoiled. Mm -hmm. I'm so very spoiled. We, All of my problems are first world problems. <laughs> right. You know, and I 
I, I, have I really suffered? It was suffering to me, but I mean, my goodness, I'm not getting bombed by Russia while I'm doing right. that heat and electricity. Well, we, so. we talked to him, I think Mike gave us a statistic yesterday about that very thing. You and I were talking about that. She was, she needed, to, you were talking about you needing your hair dryer or something. And, and then you went, well, the first world problems. Yeah. <laughs> but no, our Sunday school teacher gave us some statistics about that, that if you have a roof over your head, water, clothing, then and food. you are considered by uh, no, in a car or a car, transport tra uh, access, access to transportation. transportation. Then you are considered by whoever makes up those rich right. and wealthy because 80% of the world does not even have those basic things. Right. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. We just need to know we're going to suffer, but that doesn't mean God is displeased with us. Right. We are living on the same earth as all these other sinners that we're worried about. And I tell you, it'll, it'll give us compassion. So we get to verse 8. Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. This is a Phoenician town. And stay there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he rose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow was there gathering sticks. And he called her and said, hey, can I have some water? And she's like, uh, she's going to get it. And then he says, can I have the bread that's in your hand? And she's like, hey, I'm about to starve, dude. This is for me and my son. I'll get you the water, but I'm not giving you the food. Right? Is that pretty much uh, how you see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, she expected that she was going to eat the last of it and they were going to die. They're gonna that's die. what she says. Exactly. So this woman is a Phoenician woman. So he goes from cutting to this town. And what is so interesting, you know, I start getting into all that word, those words. Zarephath means refine to refine so the a r e p h a t h means to refine or refinery so up here he has learned about a servant identifies with the people you're serving. He's learning how to identify those you serve. Now, God's going to refine him some more. Oh my goodness, it's so exciting. How did he know she was a widow? He didn't. He called out to her and yeah. finds out, right? Isn't that what he says? It just said, Behold. Behold. A widow was there. So maybe, maybe they're just didn't tell that it was a widow. Yeah. 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 I just think he just called out to her and found out. He, you know, he's not giving us the blow by blow conversation, but yeah. hey, there we are. So. This that is cross reference with Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 17. So what is the first thing that he does? He asks for a drink of water first. He yeah. asks for water, which she could give him. Mm -hmm. And then he asks for food. Why do you think he's doing it that way? Yeah, he'd been without water. A little bit, he'd been without water. Yeah. What, but he was also without food now, wasn't he? No more ravens, no more meat, no more bread, right? Yeah. And this is 100 miles from where he was. So from the Book of Charity, he's gone 100 miles into the Phoenician territory. There's no water. Apparently, he's had probably enough to get him there, but he's out now. So what is he doing? Maybe he's seeing where where she stands. He's testing her. Yeah. 
Now, is that a bad thing to do? Well, no. No. He should test. Not at his position. It was, it was not, but he was doing what he was supposed to do. So God has sent him, and he's asking questions. Starving is going on, right? Yeah. Because she's picking up sticks to make her last cake. She's, mm -hmm. she's, this is it. And he asked that kind of question. That would not be a question that you or I would ask because we're like, that's for a woman. She must be skin and bones. She's about to die. She sees that bread. But he says to her, make me a cake first. Do that for me first. And then what? What will happen to you if you make me a cake? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all I'm... So he says, do not fear. Go, do as you said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and your son. That sounds so selfish. <laughs> Doesn't it? But it also is kind of establishing how much she trusts him. Exactly. And, and a man woman interaction was, yes, and a Jew, yes, Phoenician was very, you know, so it puts himself in kind of, uh, you know, I don't have any bread, you know, right. and even though I'm a Jew and high and mighty, and although I'm not dressed like I'm high and mighty, right. you know, uh, but it kind of is establishing this kind of a relationship and building trust with this woman. And of course, her trust won't be fully built until she goes in there and actually does what he asked her, but he got them enough to do it. What does that say about her willingness to listen? You see, uh, I, I had this incredible opportunity Saturday with one of my clients who's Jewish to give her my testimony when I was doing professional tour. And uh, I just thought the reason that I was able to do that, she's been coming to me for a long time, is because she trusts me. And I had her at the end. I said, I'm praying for you. And she's like, Well, you just said some things I needed to hear today. And I said, Well, praise the Lord. But you see, if I'm going into a Phoenician town, mm -hmm. God is sending me in. I have to establish some things. First of all, am I trustworthy? He's telling her, Make me a cake first. Don't fear. It's a test. Mm -hmm. Are you going to trust that I'm really the man of God that God sent to you? She does it. Yeah. And in her words to him, as the Lord, as the Lord, your, your God lives, I have no bread. Yeah. But do you really not have any bread? And, and maybe it's, uh, he's trying to be relationship. He's trying to make a little bit of a relationship. Right. He says, he says to her, well, let's go back up to that. He said, um, she said, as the Lord lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. Behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. He says, don't be afraid. Look, he, how does he approach King Ahab? Matter of factly. Matter of factly. How does he approach the woman? What has he learned in the book of Jared? Well, he's matured. <laughs> Absolutely. He's saying, listen, I understand that you're afraid. I get it. But if you trust God, if you trust me, I trust God. He says, in verse 14, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour should not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. What does she do? She did it. She made it. She did it. According to his words. What do people look for? What do people want? What is he giving her? Hope. Hope. How do if if you want to speak to somebody in a dire situation, hope is what you give them. Mm -hmm. What do we have to offer people? Nothing except hope. Except hope. And how do we give that gift to people? By how he has delivered us. Our testimony is not, and I I am I have a really 
I, I do not allow people to give testimonies that are woe as me. Whoa, and this happened and that happened. No, no, no. Your testimony is about how God delivered you out of your sin and changed you and made you the person that he called you to be. That's what he is doing. He could have said, oh, man, girl, I understand. I've been over here by the brook and I've been having to eat some unclean animals and more. He didn't do that. First thing he says is stop digging. <laughs> stop digging that pit. I'm going to rescue you. So it's an amazing picture of how God delivered and how he took him out of cutting. He cut some things away from him to help him. And now he's going to refine him. The things we go through in our walk is for this purpose. To refine us, to make us more able, to make us more understanding. Because I get, I get very upset when people become very, they chop everybody. The church chops each other off at the knees all the time. We are the most choppiest people you ever want to meet. Terrible. So he goes to be refined. And then what happens? So the woman makes the cake. And what happens? There was they they <laughs> Now, here's the deal. How's everybody else doing? I wonder how the rest of that town's doing. Probably a little bit of a gossip going on. She never runs out of business. What's going on here? Right? What happens next? Verse 17. The Lord dies. Her son died. The son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. His sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. I'm telling you, man. It's pretty distressing to lose a child, especially when you have done something so amazing. She has trusted God. She has done, she has given her life. Basically, that bread that she was making, that oil, that flour that didn't run out was a continual action of trust. But was God only refining Elijah or was he refining that woman? The woman, too. Absolutely. She says, you've come and brought my iniquity, to my sins to remembrance and put my son to death. I lived, that's how I was. Not that much later. <laughs> I never would have thought. I did everything you said. I trusted you. Well, but she's called him a man of God. Sure. You know, and so she recognizes the God that he worships and, and knows that their opinion is their idol worshipers and, and that sin right. and the way they live their lives. And right. so now you've brought my sins to to me. To me, and, and my son has died because of it. So you know, she's she's I would I don't know how I would feel and all that. You know, it doesn't matter what I've done for Elijah. It's that now I recognize my sin and my son has died. Okay. I'm gonna think this through a little bit. We're obviously not gonna get to chapter 18. <laughs> I knew we weren't. I knew we weren't. It's a very important chapter, but next week. Okay. So I want you to think about this in our own walk. Why do believers become disillusioned with God. What brings about disillusionment? Something happens out of their control. Right? The faith waiters. The faith waiters. Who is this test really for? It's really I, I think it's for both Elijah and the woman. But when you think about her response, and I totally get it. Why are you doing this to me? Now, in my own personal walk, I can really identify with this woman because I, I lost two children. And so I can remember when my second child died, that was a very devastating thing. And I was not a believer. Now, I, I believed in God. And I think that's where she's at. She believes in God. You know, she sees the guy 
you're the man of God, you're the prophet, and all these great things happen. So she's seen some benefit from that relationship. But then comes the death of her son. And I'm telling you, when my son died, I was on my knees at the hospital saying, why are you doing this to me? Oh, yeah. I was angry at God. It took me a few more years, I mean, to, to before I got saved. I mean, it was a big problem for me. Uh, and so I think when we look at the what this woman is doing, she is acting on the faith that she has based on what he is saying and her faith is based in his actions. Not that she believes for herself. Okay. So what does he have to, what's he, where's his growth? Where, what does he do? He has compassion for this, this right. Gentile woman. Right. He says, give me your son. He takes the son from her, carries him to the upper. He must have been a little kid. That's carries, what I'm thinking. Yeah, a little kid. Yeah, she's holding. Yeah. Right. Takes him to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. And he called to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I'm staying by causing her son to die? That is a very tender, genuine moment. This is a man in the next chapter who's going to kill 850 prophets. Okay? What needs to happen for him right now? This test isn't just her. It's testing her real faith. Does she believe in God because he is God? Does she believe in God because of Elijah's blessing? This is her crucible. What is his? What is Elijah's test? Well, I'm sure he's questioning what the Lord's going to do for him as well. And he knows that he has this power to go to God right. and be able to perform this miracle. But, but does he really know? So many times... We, we read the word and we say, okay, God, I hear your word. I see what you're saying. But do you hear me? Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And I think Elijah's in this, this spot where I hear you. I've been obedient. I've done everything that you said. You've protected me. But do you hear me? Am I just your tool? Yes. Or am I your son? How intimate is my relationship with the Lord? Intimacy in Christianity is a very confusing word. I think it's very difficult. I, I think that uh, churches, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think that we often judge relationship or intimacy or commitment by what we see. Oh, this is the person that raises their hand when they pray. Oh, this is the person that cries when they sing or whatever. And somehow we, we relate that to right? <laughs> I mean, this was I'm crying crying yesterday. When, <laughs> that just made me think about someone posted on Facebook yesterday that they were going to root for the Philadelphia Eagles because their coach was crying during the national anthem. <laughs> exactly. Do you see what I'm saying? Now we're swayed by it. We're swayed <laughs> by, ex other people. Oh, yeah. by external. But does that really mean intimacy with God? Now, my sister, uh, Nancy, is the, she is a prayer warrior. She's got a prayer room. She took. Yeah. She has two closets. She has one closet. She goes in there. She's got her music. I mean, she's been there for hours praising the Lord. And she's genuine, man. It is the real deal. And I, I am not that person. You think I would be? I'm a worship leader. Wouldn't I be? It? No, I'm not that person. But I'm well, so. We have our gifts. That. We have our gifts. She's amazing. She's a prayer warrior, and she. And so I never. Uh, I went to uh, her church. I was a guest worship leader at her church. One Sunday, I never really seen her in action. That's like, 
When she, she, they do pub, they do corporate prayer. Like she's had a prayer because she is a prayer warrior. Yeah. But when she does it, she's demonstrative. And God said, and you should. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, but I love it because it's genuine. Yeah. I know her and I know how compassionate she yeah. is. And she'll just come up to people and say, Jesus loves you. You know, it's like, <laughs> Don't you need people like that? I love people like that. I, I, it's so not me. And I really want to be more demonstrative that way, but I'm not. And so... Um, well, I was raised Baptist. <laughs> well, it's a Bible church. It's not, it's not a charismatic church. I sometimes think that we are conservative to a fault. Right. You know, oh, that there's that there isn't that demonstration. Right. Actual. And there should be. You know, my pastor just said Sunday, you know, worship, man, get up there, raise your hands, worship, engage with God. I mean, we have people in the church that raise their hands I when they're singing, when they're praying and stuff like that. Have you seen the comedian that goes, we have the goalpost people? Yes. 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 We have the Kyle Hitler people. Carry my TV. Carry my TV. <laughs> <laughs> So, but the point is, is that when we're looking at the situation, gotta finish this because you know, I have to go to prison now. Yes. <laughs> when we look at this situation, there are several things that got Elijah is being refined. God put him in a situation where he sees great success, and then in the end, this woman's child died. Don't you think he was incredibly burdened by that? Why is this happening? Like, oh no. <laughs> I told I, her that I, it was going to be okay. Yes. yes. He took the child, brought him to the upper room, and and he laid it. What did he do? He prayed for him three, right? Yes. He laid upon him, laid himself upon the child three times and called the Lord and said, Oh Lord, my God, I pray you let this child's life return to him. And the Lord told them. And then Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in, in your mouth is truth. <clears throat> what was the problem here? <clears throat> Elijah was uh, the woman believed in Elijah because of what he was doing. So Elijah had a problem here. Right? Was she? Huh? I was going to say, was she putting more trust in Elijah yes. than she was? Before? Yes. And so what is God saying to Elijah, the child is in God's hands and only God can deliver the child. Only God can deliver the woman. Only God can deliver Elijah. Elijah was having tremendous success and God gave him a little check. Now look, you know, don't don't think mm -hmm. that you got the big boy pants on here because I'm God. It's me. It's me doing it. Well, that's what all these tests do. It forces us to go down. Yeah. yeah. A test qualifies what we believe. Right? Because the next big test, right here, that's a big one. That's a bigger one. If we want to grow in our walk, if we want to uh, see God moving in our lives, the very first thing we have to do 
is not run from the test. And the next thing, important thing, is to recognize that it is a test. Um, sometimes tests come and we are calling it something else. Mm -hmm. Oh, because they're a sinner, because this is happening, because they don't know. It's all the stuff out there. It doesn't matter what the reason is. If it's coming to me, God is using it to remind me. And sometimes we, we're wallowing too much oh, yes. to recognize that. Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. Well, we've had fun, fun time. 1130. <laughs> this is an incredible study. I love this study. It's so good. Um, Y'all pray for each other this week because next week we'll do 18 and we'll try to do part of the next lesson too. I'm trying to, maybe I can incorporate it together. It would be good to put 18 and 19 together. Uh, I just want to read, now this is uh, uh, something that I wanted to say here about this. Uh, I'm, I'm not, not chapter 18, but it, it's uh, in Great Glory's Harvest Letter, he shares his view of who Great Glory is. He's a Calvary Chapel pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm reminded of the story of George Smith, a missionary in Africa. It would seem from all outward appearances that his ministry was a failure. He'd only been in Africa for a short time when he was driven from the country. He left behind only one convert, a poor woman. He died a short time later on his knees praying for Africa. One hundred years later, a missionary agency traced more than 13,000 converts back to the ministry of George Smith. While George Smith didn't live to see the answer to his prayer, God still answered them. Sometimes God's answers aren't exactly what we think. Sometimes his answers take time. I love that. I, I think... We're going to talk about chapter 18, and hopefully we'll get chapter 19 in there. We'll just kind of, let me look at chapter, lesson three. I haven't written, I'm going to write it this week. Uh, 19, we'll try to get it. We'll, we just have to do our best. <laughs> That's going to work, but we're going to get it. I just want to encourage you guys that um, as you go through this study, don't don't beat yourself up if you don't get everything just right. But, but, uh, I, I, this, this, this study is the challenge to the holiness of our lives and our trust in God, who he is, what he does, and his faithfulness to us. We may not see the fruit. But I think about my grandmother, the godly woman. She, I'm reading, she, I, I really believe she prayed me into the kingdom. She never got to see the things that I do. But in heaven, she sees what God is doing to us. That's what she's saying now. And that is awesome. Just got to trust that he's going to do those things. Let's pray. Father, just thank you so much for all that you are doing in our lives and how your word brings light. How your word shows us that you know what we need. You know how we need to be changed. You know whether we need the ravens to feed us, whether we need uh, a cup of water, whether we need to fall down and pray for a child. I don't even know, but in each one of our lives, there are circumstances, there are situations that we feel defeated in. And yet, Lord, you have promised to be faithful to us. You know our needs. You know where we are. You know our unsaved family members. You know our circumstances. And Father, what I pray is that we would learn to trust you. Trust you. And that you would grow our faith. I praise you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty. When I was uh, doing all this part about Elijah, I, what, what was